Si en el anca, brillante se den las crines, el nervio tierno y alerta. So, um, good afternoon. Uh, uh, welcome to this, uh, this session. Uh, I'm Ricardo Hausman. I'm the director of the Center for International Development at Harvard University. Uh, this session is entitled uh, New Engines of Growth uh, for Latin America. Uh, as you know, Latin America has had, uh, the past decade has been its best decade in a long time, uh, but it has been a decade that has been helped by uh, very significant increases in uh, commodity prices. So it's been a decade that has been easier for the countries in South America that export commodities vis-a-vis uh, -vis the countries in Central America and Mexico that have had uh, much tougher times. Uh, as you know, those countries are on the export side of China, competing with China in third markets and even in their own countries, uh, while South America has been more on the import side of China and has been pushed up by, by Chinese growth. Um, as we look forward, we cannot imagine that terms of trade and commodity prices are going to be rising or high forever. And uh, in spite of the fact that Latin America has had this very favorable external environment uh, over the last decade, growth rates have been mediocre, so 4% and so on. I know that the uh, people in Wall Street get extremely excited about growth in Latin America because they think in dollar terms. And uh, since there's been so much appreciation of the currencies in Latin America, GDPs measured in current dollars, they have appeared to have gone up much more than that. Uh, but real uh, output and real wealth has, uh, has grown at, mm, say, average of 4%. Uh, for the region as a whole over the last decade. And the IMF is projecting something like 3.5% for the coming decade. So it's, uh, it's good, it's better than in the past, but it's somewhat lackluster. So we lack, we lack uh, new engines of growth that can push the, con the continent forward at a, at a more decent pace. Uh, we have a really uh, star-studded panel uh, to, uh, to help us uh, think through these issues. Uh, and I'm going to be introducing uh, each one of them as, as I ask them to speak. Um, uh, the first one uh, that I'm going to ask you to speak is John Asua. He's the president and CEO of Innovating Lab, uh, which, uh, and he's uh, a former Minister of Industries of, of uh, the government of the Basque country. I'm, Basque country, I think, is a good example uh, for Latin America because uh, they faced very, very dire circumstances in the 1980s um, uh, when, when he was in, in the Basque government. Uh, they, had the, they were losing their shipbuilding industry, they were losing their steel industry, they had to find new engines of growth, and, and they did. And today, uh, the Basque country, in the middle of the Spanish crisis, has 10% unemployment, while the rest of Spain has over 25% unemployment. So, so they have been able to, uh, to find new engines of growth, even in a very tough uh, economic environment. Now John is investing in a bunch of industries in different Latin American countries, and he has a perspective on, on Latin America as an investor. So I would like to ask uh, uh, John Asua to tell us a little bit, in the language you choose, uh, what are the lessons uh, about how to find, how to nurture, new engines of growth, and where are you seeing those engines of growth in Latin America? Five minutes, please. Okay, thank you very much. Well, so first of all, it's uh, very uh, difficult to try to come here to bring any type of lesson, but uh, what I'd like to do is to share experiences. What we have done, of course, in a very small country, but within a very complex time, in a complex uh, consideration that can be available and useful for a lot of us. As uh, Mr. Hosman has uh, explained, uh, in, the, in the 80s, when the Basque country arrived to a new political situation with assuming and appropriating the responsibility of our future, that is a very important lesson that I can give to um, Latin America. Today, the president of Panama uh, told us that it's time for Latin America to be player, not only seer, viewer, or spectator. This is very important. The main thing and the first lesson is you have to choose your destiny, your future, and to provoke it and work to build it. That means that you need a strategy. 
We were in a deep crisis. We had to begin from scratch. And the important thing that we first done was let's set a vision and a strategy that can move all the country, all the companies, and of course, the new government that had to be defined at that time. But you can't begin from scratch. You have a lot of uh, industries in crisis. You have a lot of uh, lack of experience. You have a lot of policies that are not working. You have a lot of workers that maybe, if you go into any economy, are not going to find a job in their future or in their life. You have to make a lot of different things. So another important thing is you have to make the change in the economic policy at the same time that the social policies. Today, when we're talking in Latin America mainly about the inclusive development, is the key element that is behind any type of competitiveness strategy. So what we decided was to set a framework to get into, a, I can say, an umbrella that was a competitiveness strategy in order to work in the whole, at that time, we were talking about the diamond, the full, complete, or build an ecosystem. Not just work with one or two companies, but work to build a country that can provide the different linkage, the different complete economy to be developed, joining this economic and social things. We made uh, three previous questions that was say to the country, to the parliament, in order to say, well, do we continue keeping and improving manufacturing? Remember that in 1980, all the academic uh, expertise, the different public policies, all people were saying, you have to avoid manufacturing because the future is services. And in a very element and simple decision, the economy was divided into natural resources or primary sector, uh, industry or manufacturing, and uh, services. What we decided there was the manufacturing was the core, was our culture, was the type of skills that we have, and of course, we needed to improve it as source for technology, source for innovation, source for improvement of other things. The second one was uh, we need to bring to the country not only foreign investment, but also to improve the investment of our local people. That, I have to remind that in that complex crisis in which we were, we were in a time of terrorism, in a time of a very complex pos uh, position. So our brand was not very well in all around the world to attract or retain investment, and was to do a lot of special programs in, in order to provide this. The, the third one was the network, social network for our country not only in terms of being inclusive, but in terms also as a key factor for competitiveness and also the source for the new growth and the new economy and the new opportunities. Instead of seeing the problems, the lack of health, the lack of education, the lack of social services or whatever, or aging in our population or whatever, try to see this in terms of opportunities to grow, to create new things. And to do that, we introduced what at that time was not called innovation, but to innovate, to change, and to transform. Innovate governance, to be more transparent, to have a government that can be entrepreneur, public entrepreneurship, to be the developer, to be the leader that works with. The public-private cooperation in terms of long, long term, competitiveness is about 20, 30, 40 years. It's not about uh, a governance uh, term of four years to be innovative in the new way of relationship with the different countries and markets, to be innovative in the way of our internal organization and labor relationship, and to be innovative in the new sources of understanding this type of growth. So what is important again is have a strategy and a vision, involve people, set a framework, understand the model that you are going to share with all people, and the three eyes, instruction, investigation, or research, and impact. You need to make a lot of instruction to share with all people, to all the actors, what are you meaning about competitiveness, what are you doing about meaning about innovation and what you are trying to do with the country. Second, you need uh, this investigation in order to open mind to see what's going along the world, but not to copy, but try to appropriate it, own it, and make that the local and your people can manage and have 
the right control of all these. So Latin Americans have to control your theater, have to control what's going to be done, I have to manage the companies, the foreign investors, and the different things that are coming here. We come here, but we have to share to work with the Latin Americans that are the only ones that are going to do. And finally, a very important thing is to create impact. To create impact is easier, of course, to create it in a small country. So one important thing is, if you have a big one, it's very important to break it down. It's very important to federalize, to decentralize, to go into the regions, to go into the provinces, into the cities, because it's the best space in which you can create a real impact. Why? Because there is where people can create networks, is where you trust and have confidence with who is leading this process, is when you can share really what's needed, and very important thing is belonging. People need to belong and to have self-esteem with the country, with the region, with the space in which you are working for. It's not only about one company, it's about companies, regions, communities. It's about the new way that I can say, trying to reinvent, innovate, and co-create value, co-create from different regions, different countries, government, private sector, and the new role of business and the new role of government. That would be my, my first statement. Thank, Thank you. you, John. Thank you very much. Um, let, me, uh, let me move on to uh, Gary Coleman. Gary Coleman is the Managing Director for Global Industries at Deloitte. He's in the consulting side. He's consulted. He's helped companies everywhere in the world and has a long experience in manufacturing. So. <clears throat> John has just said that uh, the wisdom of the time in the 1980s in the Basque country was that forget about manufacturing, move on to something else, you're dead. There is, that's a very prevailing idea in Latin America today, uh, manufacturing is something for the Chinese, forget about it. Uh, but uh, we do have a manufacturing industry in Latin America. It's important to know uh, is manufacturing a potential engine for growth for Latin America going forward and what would it take? Uh, what, 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 where, what would require for a country, whether it's Mexico or Costa Rica, uh, to transform manufacturing into an important new engine of growth? Thank you, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, I guess to start with, uh, I do think that in select countries in Latin America, uh, manufacturing, if done correctly, if invested correctly by the private enterprise and supported uh, effectively by the government can be uh, an engine for growth. Um, in answering the question which uh, uh, countries should invest in manufacturing and which ones should not in Latin America is a, is a little bit like um, uh, telling your second child that you like him better than your third child. So um, I'm going to answer it in a slightly different way that you'll still be able to get the, get the answer. Um, I think at the very beginning what, what, what one factor you really need to look at is to think about uh, what are the future factors of, of manufacturing competitiveness going forward, not just within the region of Latin America, but around the world. Because if you, uh, if you are going to become a manufacturing enterprise, sooner or later, and probably sooner, you're going to be competing uh, in the global marketplace, either by exporting and competing that way, or by selling locally and competing with imports. So uh, we recently did a study uh, with about 150 uh, CEOs of multinational companies that make things. So you can think of them broad-based uh, manufacturers, manufacturing enterprises. And we've been doing this for the last uh, maybe four to five years. And every year, uh, things that you would think of, like cost of material, uh, cost of labor, uh, cost of infrastructure, uh, the ability to do business, all ranked uh, very high in terms of being a major factor of competitiveness. This last year was the first year, at least that we've been doing this study, that uh, the number one factor was uh, talent-driven innovation. And it was hardly on the radar screen three or four years ago, and now uh, by a high margin, these 150 CEOs that run global NMNCs around the world are saying that talent innovation uh, is the number one factor going forward around manufacturing competitiveness. 
So for sure, what follows uh, third and fourth is uh, cost of materials and cost of labor. But uh, this is new information around talent-driven innovation being the number one criteria, at least in this sample set, of, um, uh, of, of manufacturing competitiveness. Now, the second thing I would, I would think about is uh, when you think of a manufacturing enterprise and you think about what it takes to, to make it successful, uh, all those factors aren't always the same. So every manufacturing enterprise for sure has its production component, but going forward that production uh, and its added value add into the value chain is much less than many other areas of the enterprise. So what's growing is uh, areas like research and development, uh, uh, expertise in sales, and marketing, even if it's B2B or business to business, industrial marketing is becoming more and more important, as is uh, logistics, as is uh, post-sales customer support. So if you think back about a manufacturing enterprise as recently as maybe even 10 or 20 years ago, that component called production used to take up a lot of value add. It took up a lot of cost. But today, think about all of your iPads and iPhones that you have, that unit of production doesn't represent the same value in the overall cost uh, as it used to. And so if, if you're a country in Latin America and you're choosing to move up the value chain from whether it's from uh, a, a, a commodity distribution into some form of manufacturing, whether it's, it's a low-end manufacturing or high-end manufacturing, I think it's important to be aware that the components of a manufacturing enterprise are changing, and that component called production is getting smaller and smaller, and other components like marketing and sales, research and development, and customer support are getting uh, uh, much larger. Now, we heard uh, this morning from in the, in the original preliminary session from the three presidents, they mentioned uh, a talent uh, and labor shortage, a labor sh shortage in the sense of of uh, being able to fulfill uh, uh, a good paying job. Well, that still exists, and it's not just in Latin America, it's worldwide, and it even exists in some of the major powerhouse manufacturing countries uh, like China. Uh, China was cited recently as producing uh, literally thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of engineers uh, every year, but uh, only about 5% are actually qualified after they graduate to really, to, to, to really obtain uh, a manufacturing enterprise job. So I think that that needs to be uh, taken in as well into this. It's, it's the, the need for talent that is really going to uh, be, be one major component that separates the winners and the losers. So again, if you're in a country in Latin America, to answer Ricardo's question, uh, do you have the ability to, to uh, uh, recruit talent, develop talent, and make sure that that talent is the type of talent that the businesses want. And my last point, and I'll close, is, is deals with this notion of innovation, because this is really one key question you have to ask yourself, uh, whether you're sitting out there representing a government or representing private enterprise. Uh, we re recently did a study with 7,000 Generation Y individuals. These are people that are basically 30 years and younger. And uh, that 7,000 in 2025 is going to re represent over 75% of the workforce. So I say listen up to what they say. And here's what they said. This relates to innovation. They said, number one, 75% of them said that innovation is a critical factor for future economic success and, and, and profitable growth going forward, 75%. 65% of them said that that a key factor of an employer of choice, meaning who do they want to go work for, is going to be the behavioral traits that they have around innovation. And the third most important point that they said, only 18% said that the current organizations that they work in today exhibit the kind of innovational traits that they find or they believe to be necessary uh, for future success. So I do believe in summary that manufacturing can be an engine for growth if you take into a lot of considerations that both my fellow panelists and myself just indicated. But in particular, take the comment around innovation. 
uh, uh, you do need to innovate. Uh, the, the old ages of old uh, uh, smoky uh, industrial manufacturing facilities is really uh, uh, going away, and manufacturing today is very knowledge-centric and innovative-centric uh, a world. Thank you very much. Um, um, uh, that was uh, very thoughtful. There is uh, more, more to manufacturing than just production. <laughs> there is uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, uh, now, uh, let's move on to Jordi Botifol, who is the president uh, for Latin America of Cisco Systems. Uh, Cisco, as you know, is a company that produces technological solutions in the IT sector. Uh, Cisco in Latin America both sells its, uh, its technology to, in, in all of the continent, and it produces uh, and designs in part of the continent. Uh, so you are seeing from your vantage point both sides. The diffusion of new technologies, what are the option, uh, engines of growth that the diffusion of that technology is going to open up, but you're also seeing where in Latin America you've decided to set up shop and, and how do you find the environment and do we have a, a, a role to play in the world's IT industry as a producer? So what are your perceptions? Well, first, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much to give me the chance to be part of this audience. Uh, thanks very much as well to my, my fellows. Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, I would say that Latin America is a very, very interesting geography in all sense. Uh, it's a priority for us. Many reasons. One reason is potential growth. There is a potential growth. Second reason is talent. People, talent to be developed, as Gary was saying as well. But there is talent, uh, so we can develop. It could be a great, great opportunity. Third is more or less some countries they have a legal framework that provides security and support for the investments. That's that's crucial to keep it developing that legal framework. Four government support and commitment to develop broadband initiatives, digital frameworks, applications, services, education to make sure the people have the right usage of the technology and translate that usage into business impact and social developments. That's important, a government commitment in that. The ability to develop ecosystem, we set up a manufacturing and a smart manufacturing plan. We need to make sure that there is an ecosystem around as a partnership model that keep a continuous and ongoing innovation, otherwise could become obsolete uh, over time. So it's so important those dynamics, market dynamics, and kind of stability in that sense. So Latin America has a lot of ingredients to make that happen. And we have invested in manufacturing, center of excellence, center of support, commitments with governments in terms of developing the, society, the information society. Now, having said that, there are also challenges, and there are some learning lessons from other countries in the past. I'm coming from Europe, and we, in some European countries, we experience a great growth for more than a decade. In some countries, 15 years. Great GDP growth. However, based upon some engines that didn't help out for the competitiveness. So we saw some European countries growing every year, but the competitiveness gaps even getting bigger instead to, be the, to have the ability to bridge them. So when the economic cycle changed and that those economic growth engines uh, were, were exhausted, all those economies collapsed. When I take the Latin America countries, especially the World Economic Forum uh, ranking, scoring the competitiveness, you see exactly the same symptoms in terms of uh, we see even countries score 61, 62, 70. Even I think the, 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 highest, uh, the highest score, uh, I mean, the most innovative within the Latin America, I think is Chile with 34. This is what the World Economic Report. So, Overall, this is a call out in terms, let's take this good momentum, this, the current stability, to make the right actions to foster innovation, to foster be better productive uh, models, 
and to create more business models that when one system is exhausted, the dynamics are flexible enough to help to capture, capture the other one and we see, you know, sustainable growth. So all the people here in all this audience, we have that responsibility and to work together with governments, with private entities, with different market segments to foster the information society development, to take into consideration those reports and to make the right actions to ensure that. That's the reason why investment, that is important and that will attract how to the ability to make the right regulatory environment to attract a consistent investment and continuous investment, which is what innovation needs over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's very interesting how, how the terms innovation, talent, adaptation, and so on have come up over and over. So I think it's, um, it's a great opportunity to ask uh, um, Mari Elka Pangestu. She's the Minister of Tourism and Creative Economy of Indonesia. I find it great that there's a minister for the creative economy in, 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 in Indonesia. You're facing very similar challenges. Uh, we all know of Indonesia as the spice uh, area of the world, and, and you moved into, from, from spices into oil and from oil into a bunch of uh, manufacturing and, and paper and stuff. And now you are getting into the creative industries. What is the challenge that you're facing for Indonesia? And what lessons do you want to share with us as to what are, what do you find the to-dos for the road ahead? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo. Uh, I'd like to share uh, Indonesian and uh, East Asian experience. Uh, we managed to overcome the global crisis by growing at 4.9% in 2009, and we've been growing at about 6% uh, in the last few years uh, after the rebound. And a lot of Asia is growing more or less at 4 or 5 or 6%, lower than before the crisis, but still managing a good growth. And it's bas basically, I think this is, uh, I, I noticed Latin America is also uh, doing similar strategy. You are switching to more domestic and regional demand as sources of growth as the advanced country markets slow down, especially in Europe. But what we are finding is that because we're a large market, of course, it helps that we have domestic demand as growth. The other thing that we've done in the region is to accelerate regional integration, to expand your market. And uh, I think this is uh, an important lesson, perhaps, that I know that in Latin America, there are also efforts to, to increase regional integration. Uh, because we have found that new sources of growth, in, including in tourism, including in trade, including in investment, is coming from our own region. And South-South trade has increased from 30 percent of world trade uh, five, eight years ago to 50 percent of world trade. So south-south growth, because a lot of the growth is coming from emerging and developing countries. So I think uh, I would encourage us, Latin America and Asia, to do more with each other. The second point I would make is just to reflect on a very interesting study uh, on the global value chain, uh, which reflects a lot on, on what the previous commentators have been saying. The global value chain study recently released by the WTO, OECD, and UNCTAD shows that if you want to be uh, competitive in exports, you are, you're, uh, really have to have uh, facilitating your imports because intermediate goods are an important part of being competitive in exports. It's about 40 to 60 percent. We're talking about manufacturing. And most importantly, to be competitive, you have to have competitive services to support you to be uh, competitive in exports. So that opens up a whole new, uh, this fragmented global value chain where a country can leapfrog. You don't have to go through, you know, low, low end manufacturing and then going to higher end and then going to services. You can actually leapfrog and pick the niche in that long global value chain. You were saying it's not just production. Yes, absolutely. It's production and services, which is very, very fragmented. So small companies can be part of it. Small countries can be picking any part of it. If you're a larger country, you could probably have more of that supply chain. And that's exactly where uh, a lot of the diversification in production is happening in Asia. So when you talk about value chain and production networks in Asia, it's no longer just about production and intermediate goods. It's also about the services 
resources component. And that's one of the reasons why my government uh, a year and a half ago created this ministry called uh, Tourism and Creative Economy. So tourism and Services is the number five uh, foreign exchange earner for us, also create a lot of empo employment. Creative industries, if you like, is this talent-based, innovation-based kind of uh, systems that are creating all over the world. Next time you watch Garfield, bear in mind, 50% of that is being made in Indonesia, uh, in an island called Batam. Uh, and as I'm looking into the film industry, which is one of the industries under my uh, watch, I'm finding that I'm competing with Colombia. <laughs> Colombia is giving a lot of good incentives for the film industry and a lot of telenovelas coming out, a lot of Hollywood production being made there. So it, the, it's endless. And uh, the ability of, so the challenge is really infrastructure, not just physical infrastructure, any more, but also the uh, telecom, uh, teleconnect, interconnectivity uh, uh, infrastructure. So the, the broadband and the mobile phone, the ability for you to, to connect with each other. Because we have found that in the creative uh, industries, a lot of outsourcing being done for design, for um, uh, all kinds of uh, parts of the services uh, sector, which, and you can be anywhere. You don't have to be in Jakarta, in uh, the major capital city. You can be anywhere. Uh, in Indonesia, and that's kind of a whole new opening up. And the final thing I would say is that it's also good for uh, social uh, connectivity because you are finding farmers can, if, if they are connected uh, and, and mo in the mobility sense, they can check prices, they can bargain with the buyer if they know the prices. Uh, we, our cocoa farmers know the price in the New York uh, commodities market every day so that they know what, what is the price of cocoa they can sell. And I just, my final example, because it is in Peru, I just read an article on the plane uh, on The Economist uh, which showed that the, in the Andean uh, hills, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the f a price of uh, the rural income went up by 73% in the last decade because the roads got better, the time to travel travel was halved and mobile phones went up by 4% to 50%. You know, so I think this is the huge uh, challenge ahead of us for Asia as well as Latin America. And uh, I would, the final, final, final point is what you were main, mentioning, the innovation and the talent base, because we have to invest, therefore, in human capital, uh, in the necessary skills that they, they can participate uh, in this global value chain. Thank you. Thank you very much. In so this is an interesting point of view because uh, the manufacturing sector in Latin America has always asked for more protection. And what you're saying is that uh, in order to get into manufacturing today efficiently, you want the more openness, yes. you want to have less hassle with and your services. imports. And you need services, so it's not manufacturing versus services, it's services so that you can have manufacturing. And, and, and so this is, these are very important and, 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 and paradigmatic shifting uh, comments. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so let's move now on to Katia Abreu. Katia is uh, the senator from Tocantins in Brazil, the país mais grande do mundo, and uh, um, it's a country that has had a spectacular success in generating a revolution in agriculture that has allowed it to extend its agricultural area and so on at a moment where agricultural prices have been strong. It's a powerhouse in mining. All of that has translated into significant domestic growth uh, and a very, very strong exchange rate that have, <coughs> has put enormous pressure on the traditional uh, manufacturing industries and the rest of the tradable sector. Uh, your Minister of Finance coined the term um, the, the uh, currency wars. He coined the term of the monetary tsunami that uh, is causing this uh, real appreciation. And, and you know, the, the world seen from Sao Paulo does not look as exciting from, as the world seen from Mato Grosso, where, where all this agricultural expansion is potentially happening. So, uh, how, how um, are these engines of growth that are propelling Brazil forward uh, hurting other engines of growth? Is there a way of adding engines of growth to the process? How should we manage the current situation? First of all, I would like to thank 
you very much for this invitation. It is a real pleasure and an honor to be able to sit on this forum with such notable individuals. I made a few notes so that I wouldn't lose sight of the topic at hand, but in any case, the truth is that the status of industry in Brazil in terms of our GDP, I mean, it's not necessarily directly associated with the export of commodities or agribusiness. Let's Let's remember that between 1970 through 1975, industry met 27% of Brazilian GDP. And from 1988 to 1990, it already meant 21%. So we're seeing a reduction in almost 6% of our growth. And from 2000 to 2009, industry represented 17% of this and the agricultural boom started in the 1990s when we started to generate a positive trade balance and i think it's much more important for us to produce competitiveness now what agriculture has done is overcome the situation as a result of the fact that we all have had technology, state-of-the-art technology primarily, and we have been able to get an extraordinary amount of growth in 40 years, four dec decades. We have moved from just 42% of planted area but we've been able to increment production by 292% and productivity by 196%. That shows how much we have been able to do through technology and innovation, innovation and technology that has been created by, a, 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 by Imbrapa, a public research institution in Brazil. And we've been able to create an agriculture that is unique. It is tropical in nature and an agriculture for Brazil, which is very different from the technology we had imported previously from from Europe and were not adapted well to Brazil and it meant that 40 years ago that we were a net importer of foodstuff and expensive foodstuff. We were importing uh, our black beans from Mexico, even rice from Philippines, as well as milk from Europe and so forth. And with this discovery and this research through our research institute, institute in Brapa again, we were able to move forward, engage in this research, and adapt and adjust much better to the tropical agricultural climate. And I think that what we've done in innovation has been the key to our agricultural sector, which is highly capitalistic, by the way, today. The other thing is that we have to understand that if we produce more in a very small area, we also are ensuring that larger areas of forests are not being cut down. So today, thanks to technology and innovation, we are the second race rated country in terms of envir environmental conservation. We have over 60% of, of our territory and our forests that are protected, particularly in the Amazon basis. I believe that Brazil and Latin America have a fundamental role to play in the future. The FAO has told us quite rightly that by 2050, we will have 9 billion inhabitants around the globe. And that means that we will need to increment our food production by 60%. And Brazil is responsible in this period for bolstering our production by 40% to be able to reach the target and the goal. And other countries in Latin America also that are, will need to produce as well. Now, if we look at China, India, and the United States, we will find two major problems. One is an absence of new lands to be able to expand their production. And second, a problem in terms of availability of water, which is much less of a problem in Latin America and certainly not in Brazil, where we hold 12% of the fresh water on the face of the earth. Now, we have 30 million hectares that could also be irrigated. We currently irrigate 5 million hectares, and there is a, certainly a development that can be done there. We can also, therefore, increment and bolster our production without deforestation. I believe that Latin America needs to take full advantage of this opportunity of having a, if I am 
the, having the opportunity to have the most technologically advanced farms in the world. Uh, there we would uh, like to see China as an industrialized country, India as a services country, and we want to be the world's high-tech farm, high-quality production included, and a generator of employment of GDP and a strong trade balance for us. Now, we have a challenge in this. We believe that all countries in Latin America face the same challenge, and that is that we need to invest in integration among and between our countries. We are totally disconnected today, and we need to engage in this type of logistical integration. We have figures that come out this weekend, the economists that are showing the starting point when the Americans invested heavily in their railways and how fast that productive to productivity grew. It almost tripled very, very quickly. So we do need to integrate Latin America through our railways, through our highways, through the production of energy. In energy technology, and so forth, we can do a networked set of research for the entire region, taking advantage of what we have in Brazil and what other countries around the region produce as well. And we're talking about infrastructure. We know that the state and the countries in Latin America do not necessarily have the resources necessary for this, and we need to, in that context, take advantage of private investment to make that possible. Unfortunately, however, in Latin America, we I uh, have to uh, we have this full idea in place that the state should be the provider the supplier in many places in many countries and therefore there are some countries that are still a bit loath to allow for public uh, private rather investment to play an important role I I'm a politician I am a senator but I'm also the chair of the Confederation of the Agricultural Grouping that's similar to the Farm Bureau in the United States. And I believe that we can engage in a tremendous partnership with the private sector. And I believe that other politicians across the region need to lose the fear that they still continue to hold of the private sector. Well, the private sector can lead us to a huge step forward, and our public sector, we have to understand, is lagging behind in terms of processing and of instituting modern processes. We need to update our policies in that regard and institute a merit-based merit system for promotion. I have the impression that the Europeans and the Americans that are here really don't understand what we mean by uh, what I'm saying this, but nonetheless, we still have the sponsorship of the state of uh, these uh, types of, uh, in, and the influence of political parties to an extent, extensive uh, extent, and we still have uh, problems of corruption and so forth. So therefore, I believe that we need the free market. And as my colleague here on this panel has said, we need to do away with the fear of the private sector, as I've also repeated. Agriculture needs certain basic elements. It needs rains. Uh, it needs qualified labor. It needs good quality seeds. Uh, it needs powerful machinery. But the most important aspect that we need is the is sunshine, the sunshine of freedom. It is the regulatory free, uh, framework, it is the rights and the guarantees, and uh, the right to private property. That is what we need, a sunshine law that allows for private property and respect for property rights. We need to invest in this, and we will be able to produce the foodstuffs the world needs. Then, a, it's not only that manufacturing requires uh, services and openness, a, a technological revolution can also happen in agriculture, transform a country, and dynamize manufacturing and other activities that are related to it. Uh, so uh, let's move on to Carlos Garcia Moreno Elizondo, who's the chief financial officer of America Mobil in Mexico. I told Carlos, uh, listen, Carlos, I said, you know, uh, you manage uh, the, the largest fortune in the world. Uh, and you're looking for investments in new engines of growth in, 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 in Latin America and the world. So 
uh, as an investor that are looking at where are the growth opportunities, uh, how does Latin America look and where are the new engines of growth? Thank you. Thank you uh, for having us here and uh, sharing our experiences with you. Yeah, I think the, the largest fortune in the world is talent. And, uh, and it's uh, a question of how you put your talent to work and how you monitor that it generates the resource that is expected from them. Because you, when you have the talent, you have an obligation to deliver. And I think that for us in this region, uh, for America Mobile, it is important to make a difference. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit where we are today because I think it's going to be very relevant for what is going to happen in the next, uh, the next few years. Omega Mobile today is in the midst of investing $50 billion over five years. $50 billion over five years. Uh, all of this is only in Latin America. What we are going to be doing here uh, is only investing in networks. It's uh, faster networks on the mobile side, uh, and obviously much more uh, uh, fiber optic uh, infrastructure so that one can transport all the data that, uh, that will be growing exponentially for many years to come from here now on. Uh, but let me tell you how, how we got here. Uh, Telcel was a very small company in Mexico a few years ago. And uh, somebody in the company, it was wireless only, decided that maybe one could go to clients, even if the clients didn't really have a bank financing facility or some kind of a guarantee, a credit guarantee, to receive the service. All of Latin America is a region where people are not often bankable, and where it was difficult to provide services when the operators didn't really have a guarantee of payment. Well, this notion that somebody itself had at the time led to the development of the prepaid market. This prepaid market was hugely important. The company in Mexico, which was the second or third largest in the market, rapidly became the number one. And then it decided to use this good idea of prepaid. Uh, its uh, main supplier, Ericsson, has said that it was the first prepaid uh, platform that they came to know. Uh, it decided to use this uh, this exp experience they had gotten in Mexico, and to try to replicate it in other markets. So we, here we have a story where innovation leads to the definition of a business model. This business model is exportable, so it was exported to other countries in the, in the region. Uh, it was done in a way that you had a long-term horizon, investment horizon. I think in the end, there's no way around the fact that if you want to generate any kind of returns, you first have to invest your money. You have to take the risk. And that's important. When you are investing your money, uh, you may want to have a longer term horizon. And finally, once that you have uh, achieved all of this, I think it's important to be quite uh, aggressive commercially. Now, what happened in the region in these uh, last 10 years has been striking. Uh, Latin America, you know, 10 years ago, probably one in 10 people had a, a voice service, one in 10. Today, there's more than 100% penetration, which means that there's more than 10 uh, voice lines for each person that lives in the region. Uh, but this very rapid growth, where we basically back, uh, uh, leaped over the deficiencies that we had had in the past as a region, uh, and we have been able to provide both services, basic both services to basically all of the population. Uh, this experience happened over a relatively short period of time. I'm talking about three, four, five years, where you had what, uh, what is called an S-curve that developed, and very rapidly you were able to incorporate into the service the vast majority of the population. Well, we are now seeing a very interesting situation. This sector is living an extraordinary technological change. We are seeing the, the, what is coming now with uh, mobile broadband uh, on the back of the new smartphones. Smartphones are something that have been with us just very few, few years. If you think of it, the first uh, real smartphone was the, the iPhone, 
and the first iPhone 3G uh, has been with us for only four years, only four years. So we are really leaving something that is completely new, it's really not replicable to what we had before. It's being driven by two things. On the one hand, faster transmission speeds that have enabled uh, uh, us to provide all of these services, but on the other hand, the software that allows you to make that happen. So you have uh, uh, an ecosystem uh, like the ones designed by, by Apple and then uh, the, the Android, uh, and then on the other hand, you are seeing these uh, very fast leaps in technology that are driving off the speeds of transmission. So what we have come now to realize is that on the back of these new devices, it is going to be possible to provide the basic uh, internet services and data services to the vast majority of the population, just as happened with voice. We are about to see in the next few years a real explosion in the number of people that have access to internet. Let me just give you some figures. Uh, as of today, there's only 10% of the population in all of Latin America that has a fixed broadband access. When you look at what has been the main barrier to growth of fixed broadband, it's been the high cost of personal computers. Anybody that wants a broadband access first needs something to access it with. You need a computer. And computers in the region, for a number of reasons, have been relatively expensive. Well, as it happens, with the, the smartphones today uh, are now selling for a fraction of what the personal computers could sell for. And their prices are rapidly coming down. Until a year ago, probably the cheapest smartphone you could buy was for $500. Today we can buy smartphones at $100. And we can see that uh, before the end of this year, they are going to be coming down to prices of about $50 or more. So the barriers of entry to data services for the population are collapsing. And that is going to put a lot of pressure on basically the operators to try to provide the service to this huge number of people that will be demanding it. Today in Latin America as a whole, there's only 60 million people that have a data service today. We expect this number to go to 400 million over five years. From 60 to 400. This means that the number of people that have a fixed broadband access will practically double, but then again, we're going to have approximately 300 million people out there that will only have wireless connections. Uh, now, in order to be able to provide this service, you really need to fully change the way how the infrastructure is set up. If you think of it, not that long ago, all there was, for instance, in wireless was voice. There was no data services, a little bit of SMS, uh, a little bit eventually of email, which was only text. But when you start moving uh, uh, faster uh, speeds and you have bigger loads of data to carry, the older copper cables that were the innards of the wireless networks just do not do the trick. You have to replace completely all of the wireless components. You have to put in place new fiber optic that will bring the signal from down from the antennas and transport them over to the switch so that they can be distributed widely. Uh, this means that uh, Latin America has today to build the highways, the data highways that, never, that were never built in the past. The investments that we are making today, this $50 billion that I was mentioning to you, is what is being spent mostly in the construction of these highways. These highways are going to be with us as a, a normal highways. They're going to be for, with us for many, many years. And they will probably require a little bit maintenance, Eventually, you will need to add probably another lane, if you will. But for the most part, this is the infrastructure on which the development of Latin America is going to rest for the next probably 30, 40 years. So it is hugely important, again, not only for the short-term implications that it, will, that it will have in terms of having uh, more people uh, have access to e-government, to e-education, to e-health uh, services, will allow them to be more productive, 
it will allow all of this region to be more productive and more equal. Uh, and it's something that in the end uh, goes down to one thing. You need innovation, but then you need to be able to uh, have it develop its full potential in a way that really helps the overall population of the country. So that's what, what, what I would say is uh, the times that we are seeing are quite interesting. Uh, and the, it's just a question of uh, time before most everybody that you know will have, uh, you know, uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, telephone, telecom uh, and, uh, and data services, internet service. Thank you very okay. much. Um, so we have, a, we have exhausted our allotted time. They tell me that we have four more minutes. <laughs> uh, we have digested a lot of new opportunities. Uh, we have found out that uh, manufacturing means not only production, that there's design, that there's post services, there are logistics, there's um, R&D. We've seen that there are revolutions in agriculture that can propel uh, an economy forward in big time in the tropics with new ideas, new forms of production that can propel a whole uh, set of industries around it. We've heard about creative industries, uh, Indonesia having to compete with Colombia on, on, uh, on the next Hollywood or Bollywood or Nollywood, right? We, we have seen uh, the potential for getting into the IT industry per se, as, as producers or as consumers, and we've seen this revolution coming that Carlos was talking to us about uh, in terms of uh, a completely new communications landscape uh, five years from now. Uh, that will give rise to new business models, new forms of organization that are not feasible, not feasible today. So we've scanned a lot of space. I'm going to ask, um, we have now three minutes or three and a half minutes, I'm going to ask you, See if uh, any member of the panel will have a short statement that they would like to make that there's, it's burning in their... Yes. John. I think uh, uh, that it's very important to add uh, one, one point. Uh, hearing mainly what are the, the big and the huge opportunities that Latin America has. Uh, the the bottleneck neck related with infrastructure and the development of all the resources that have to be done in any time and whatever. And the great opportunity that today uh, Latin America brings to attracting foreign investment. From the point of view of, uh, I can say, a foreign investor that comes to the country and comes to Latin America, it's important to be clear here in Latin America in order to provoke their own future in terms of not only attracting the foreign investors to do whatever, but to co-create the value for Latin America as well as is needed. So this is very important. The paradox of the globalization that we are living, that countries, governments, are not only asking for technology, money, finance, or whatever to do, but to co-create the value for the country that is attracting such an investment. And this is very important in terms of people, in terms of talent, in terms of uh, technology that had be to be transferred and developed, and the huge opportunities that you have. And this is the big opportunity, not only, uh, I can say, putting there the country for everybody, but saying this is our region, this is our continent, this is our country, we have these opportunities, and we need a kind of sharing help or whatever, but to provoke our own destiny, our world solution. And this is a huge, huge opportunity for Latin America, I think. Yes, I think the global value chain with very, very fragmented uh, division of labor and services and manufacturing is the way of the future. And Latin America, just as Asia, has that opportunity. And for that to work, you need to keep your economies open, and, uh, and this means services as well as manufacturing and investment. And that would require you to also hopefully have regional integration and multilateral uh, opening up 
under the WTO on services as well as uh, investment. And uh, it allows SMEs and small countries to leapfrog. Uh, and it can be uh, so powerful for uh, income distribution. And what you need is multilateral rules, uh, global standards, uh, and not fragmented rules in each regional agreements. Thank you. And well, uh, this has been a, a wide-ranging panel. Uh, I think it uh, was not meant to be an optimistic one, but I think it ended up being a quite optimistic one. Uh, there are engines of growth out there, uh, and it's a question of whether we have the wherewithal uh, to seize them. Uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry I couldn't get to the public, but we all learned a lot. Thank you.